What's up, y'all? Here's a quick recap of last week. There's something happening with our kid, and we don't know what it is. My dad had had a pretty deep depressive spell at one point whenever we were kids and he and my mom just said look it, this might be you know the beginning of something welcome back to part two i'm so happy you're here let's dive in where we left off so i have two um mental health disorders that i've lived with for a long time I, and and it changes right one is a mood disorder um that we thought was bipolar type two for a while but my last hospitalization the psychiatric team said really you have major depressive disorder and then they said this new thing i'd never heard before with anxious distress right <laughs> so i have that one and it's tied to my adhd severe adhd um and and so what major depressive disorder with anxious distress means is this I, whenever i get depressed i don't typically just stay in bed for days Hmm. My brain that's already moving, trying to find dopamine everywhere because I don't have enough dopamine receptors, right? That's why I'm starting new projects and doing all this stuff, you know, and I can't follow through and there's going to be a cliff and I know I'm going to fall off of it. But if I just run a little bit faster, I can fly, right? You know, like all, all of this stuff. Yeah. Um, whenever my depression hits, it amplifies the chaos. Mm hmm. And so everything becomes bigger than, than I can handle. And my brain is just going so fast and moving at such a, a, a clip that the only escape that I can see is, is to die, is to, is to take my own life. Hmm. And so most of my life I've been suicidal like that. And I'm, and I have a beautiful wife, three incredible kids. I have a job that I love. I have three dogs that are like so much fun. I got a Martin guitar last year that I've been looking at and saving up for, for a long time, 1960 odd 18. I mean, it is like, it, and, it, and it had been near a fire source. So it's all scarred and stuff. I've got a really great story about that guitar too, but, um, I have all of these things that should make me like an optimist, right? Yeah. And yet still I can't see a reason to live, right? So that tells me that it's not a moral failure on my part. Right. It's not a lack of joy. I'm not just looking at this shit, but like my brain legitimately as a part of my body is malfunctioning. That's and like the, the church never told me that the church, the church always moralized it, even if they didn't think they were right. Yeah. The peace mm -hmm. that passes all understanding, man, let me pray for you that, that God would speak to you in the midst of this difficulty, right? That, that something that new life would grow from the manure that you're, you're feeling right now or whatever. And as well-intentioned as it was, and as well-intentioned as it was when I did the same things to other people, it wasn't helpful because it was Jesus plus nothing or you're a sinner and you're not putting your trust in Jesus. But now I know it's like Jesus plus Adderall, Jesus plus Effexor, Jesus plus Lamictal, Jesus plus, uh, it, you know, the medications I take, Jesus plus therapy, Jesus plus constantly checking in with myself mm -hmm. and my wife. And it doesn't mean that Jesus is diminished in that. Yeah, it, it it magnifies the avenues through which I think God can speak to me, the Spirit can lead me, um, because I'm no longer like just beating myself over the head. Which yeah. if you're, let's face it, dude, if you're chronically depressed, like beating yourself up about it is probably not the most healthy or helpful. <laughs> I, I mean, whether you're depressed or not, it's probably not because it, it'll lead you into some kind that's of depressive true, state, dude, you know, that's so true. but that's, that's, not, I wrote it down right now for a 40 minute because for my, for the promo for this, for this episode, I need to promo what you just said. <laughs> Jesus plus this doesn't diminish Jesus. No. And I think it is a subversive teaching. Sometimes, sometimes not sometimes it's on the head sometimes the church is it will make you feel like oh you're still broke after tithing you don't have enough faith or you're you're holding back something there's always <laughs> going to be some type of responsibility that that they don't see that you're doing in the dark that is keeping you from your blessing um i always was one of those people that if i if something didn't go my way i would immediately look 
okay, where did I sin? What what did I do that made me just miss out on this black? I the closest thing to today that I would count that as is in our deconstructive process. And I've said this before to be in my friends. Sometimes I wonder that because I'm not in the traditional mainstream space that is so safe that that you're like you're like laying on the lazy river of faith and and all these people are pushing you towards the direction that everybody else is going. So you're not really working for the faith. You're just like arm in arm with the traditional mainstream faith that as long as we follow these rules, we're going in the right direction, bro. Yeah. Heaven is on that that way. But then when you start deconstructing and start saying, I can't, I can't take this ride with you because I don't believe these certain things. Now you're the dude on the side not having fun and your inflated tube seems to keep losing air and you're like damn should i go back to this this ideology should i go back that's where i start feeling oh no am i in the wrong place and i start feeling a little down about myself but then i remember the freedom that i found on the other side of shame on the other side of all yeah. the rules on having to hold it all up like there's so i i've been saying this now more often than not if if religion becomes too difficult then you're doing it wrong and it's not even religion it, it, i say religion no, depending I, on I, I actually i i walked away from that word religion for a long time but then i realized that it was tied to the same root as ligament mm. something that allows movement and ties you to something um, right. And so I, I really have like reconciled with, uh, with that word. Sorry to interject. No, no, no. Yeah, but that's 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 the case. You know, whatever set of beliefs that you have, um, if it becomes too difficult, then it becomes something that is definitely a man-made thing. Mm -hmm. Like you are now trusting in yourself to get you uh, to the unknown, which is really what this faith thing is. There is an unknown in front of us, and we're we're we get mad that we can't figure this shit out when it's like, bruh, if I were to ask you the square root of 144,000, you couldn't figure that out either. So it's like Actually, 712. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm like not math person. <laughs> yeah, oh, for yeah. real. Also, by the way, I think we should shun Brandon because he's not rocking the, the red. <laughs> the red plan. Plan. <laughs> I'm wearing a, a maroon hat. Okay, that count. We'll count. It's, it's my boy's uh, mezcal you're just, company. You're just not pray. You're just not praying hard enough, man. You I'm not prayed up. Listen, I've just been busy. <laughs> no, I, I haven't got. Uh, I just, I, I, uh, I was gonna say something about that, um, that metaphor, Manny, about floating mm -hmm. on the lazy river. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think that. For me, the waters just became so torrential internally mm -hmm. and so I mean I was just, I was experiencing spiritual vertigo, emotional vertigo. I didn't know I have had moments in my life where I just couldn't catch my breath to even put any any air into the floaty device, right mm, yeah. And it was in those in those moments that it was like I I I could the the tools that I had been given were no longer sufficient. Mm -hmm. The first time I was hospitalized was in April of 2021. Um, we were in our small group. It was a Wednesday night. I think it was the 14th of April. So it's coming up on two years. And I had just reconciled myself to the fact that I was never going to be happy. Mm. I was like, it's just not in me. I, I, I want to be an artist. I can't be an artist. Uh, everything in me says create, 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 but I've got to go and find money so that my family can live. It's just never, and I'm never going to be happy, right? And so we're Wednesday night, we're with our, with our small group and we have a therapist in our small group with us. And I'm, and I'm like on the verge of tears and I'm just like completely in despair, complete despair. And she says, I think you're sick. And then I'm like talking about all this stuff. And then my friend Jason, who's in there too, he says, you know, Tim, I'm not really sure that you're 
in the position to be making decisions for yourself right now. Because my friend Mark, he always says that depression is like wearing shit colored glasses. And when you're wearing those, you need somebody else to interpret reality for you. You need a translator. And so my group that night was a translator. So you need to get help. So I took the next day off of work. I went to my doctor with my wife and she said, you need residential treatment. Like you need to go to inpatient care. And I said, I'm a teacher in middle school. We have one act play coming up. I was teaching theater. I said, I've got to get my students ready for this. I have eight more weeks of school. As soon as I'm done with school, I will go to inpatient treatment, inpatient care. And she looks at me and she says, I can remember it to this day. She looks at me, she says, Tim, I don't think you're going to make it. Wow. To summer. So the next day I check into treatment. I sleep for, I keep saying treatment, it, inpatient care at a psychiatric facility like I sleep and the first night that I'm going to dinner with everybody else who's in the unit you know you've got me who's a novice and then you've got other folks who are veterans right like they've been through it they've been there a while now I'm a veteran I've been hospitalized five times I'm the I'm the OG now at this point right <laughs> and uh we're walking to dinner in these in these these I call them kids they're like in their 20s or whatever are inviting me to sit with them and I have this chip on my shoulder like I'm like I'm here for 12 days and then I'm out, you know, and I get, I go through the line. I'm not sitting with them. I'm like, I just need some time alone. I, I sit down with my tray with my meat and gravy, whatever it is like on my, on my tray. And I had a fork because they don't have any knives, right? There's no plastic knives or anything like that. And so I'm like, how am I going to eat this thing? Do you, I just like stab it, <laughs> you know, and like bring it up to my mouth or do I perforate it, <laughs> you know, like, and then break it in half or whatever. I can't figure it out. Right. And this dude, I call him the fedora and <laughs> the, the fur coat fedora kid, because that's how he came in in psychosis and he was wearing like a fur coat and a fedora. And so like he, he's looking at me across the cafeteria and I'm like, I'm so uncomfortable, but he looks at me, he goes, turn it around. And I'm like, <laughs> like what? My tray? What? He says, turn it around. And I, I don't get what he's saying. He holds up his fork and he says, turn it. And the tines are up. And he puts it in his other hand and says, around. And I looked and on the plates of all of the OGs, all of the people that had been through it, they had two forks. They had one fork that was a fork. And then the other fork, they used the handle as a knife. Interesting. They cut the meat. And in that moment, it was like a realization that the tools that you have, like, are no longer, they're no longer adequate for, for the challenges ahead. And so you need to re-envision what that tool looks like now. So prayer for me looks very different now than it did 10 years ago, even two years ago. Mm. Meditation for me looks very different now than it did a year ago, two years ago. Um, so what does it look like? I'm curious. So prayer for me is now, um, now uh, a lot less talking and a lot more just breathing. Okay. Yeah. Prayer for me now is um, considering like what's best for others and working to, to enact that. So like my children, what does it mean for me to want the best for them? And then to like put feet to my faith and like, you know, to pray for their protection, to ask for their protection, but to also be their protector. Mm. Right. I've become a lot. I've become the answer to my prayers a lot more. And community has become the answer to my prayer. Uh, you know, I would not have survived without people, human beings, frail, fragmented, beautiful human beings that 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 have buoyed me to this life. Right. Mm -hmm. And so for me, prayer is a lot more about looking out and seeing what's around me. Um, in taking a big deep breath and saying like, this is enough, this moment right here is enough for me to stick around. Mm. Because even with all my medication, dude, there are times whenever, I mean, there, there are times whenever I have intrusive thoughts, like so, so rapid fire and I'm taking all my medications, dude. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get in bed at the same time. I'm trying to eat healthy, you know? Uh, I've been on a bender with pop tarts though for like the last. <laughs> I was doing no sugar and then I got in the hospital again. Yo, dude, it messed me up, right? They got my meds figured out, but now I'm back on the sugars. All right, <laughs> and, uh, pray for me that I'd be delivered from 
from the from the, the demon the power, of the, 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 the power of the pop tart the power of the pop tarts be loose <laughs> if you say on earth and let it be in heaven right you know like that uh, yo i wanted to ask you because you said earlier that your your dad dealt with this as well is there any is there anything in you that is like now super like looking at um, your kids like yo are they showing it you know what i'm saying is anybody yes. nervous is your wife like can this you know because i don't i don't really understand if it's something that can be passed is is it a thing like that or is it well my my dad's depression is not as severe as is mine okay like, like he has clinical depression he's dealt with it he's take he's taken medicine that like kind of what i heard you and in, in you brandon talking about that there there's circumstantial depression mm. that that makes sense mm -hmm. and then there's uh chemical Right, right, right. Depression that that you can look around and there's no rhyme or reason to it. You just can't see the light. And so my my dad's journey has been different than mine. And I've even asked him if he if he's ever been suicidal. And he said there were times whenever he thought passively, you know, about maybe something would happen to him and he could kind of like break mm. you know out of this world. Um, but he was never really suicidal. Well, yeah, it's a huge fear, Manny. It, it, if I'm being honest, like I'm afraid that this thing is going to catch up to me. Mm. Like that this is going to be the thing that, that, that I know it's chronic, but I'm afraid it's going to become terminal. Mm. And if I lean too much into that fear, then I begin to think about my kids. Like, did I pass this on to them? Well, if I pass this on to them, why, you know, it just takes me down like this really dark path. Yeah. Um, you know, our kids are very open about mental illness and mental health. My wife and I, whenever I got hospitalized, the first thing we said was we are going to be honest about this journey and we're going to be open about it. We're going to take it public. We're going to talk about the beautiful things and the difficult things all together. And because we made that choice, our, our kids have a certain resiliency whenever it comes to talking about mental health my son my eight-year-old has said i need therapy hmm. why do you need therapy because i can't figure out why i'm feeling the way i'm feeling that's profound self-realization right profound we just talk about it now does my eight-year-old know that i'm suicidal no like we we, we don't we don't burden them right, with right does my 15 year old yeah yeah she knows and she can tell before i can tell sometimes you wow. know whenever i'm spiraling my wife and my kids are my they're like oh he's putting on the shit colored glasses we better get ready you know mm -hmm. and they act my, is my translators and my um interpreters uh but yeah it's a big fear that i have dude it's a big fear that i have that i've that i've passed something on that you know, because you don't want your kids to suffer. If, even if I'm open to like a certain amount of suffering myself, like I like I understand that. Um, you want them to be well. You want them to be okay, and you don't want them to have to. Um, it's the reason why we're raising them different in the in the church too. You know. Yeah. Because we don't want them to like shoulder the burdens that we shoulder now are they gonna still need therapy when they grow up yeah like like we're trying to like screw them up as little as possible <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah 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 like we know yeah we tell them that we, look we know that we're not perfect but we're really trying hard to not screw you up <laughs> yeah <laughs> and they're gracious man they, they i think their gift is is grace and understanding too you, you know um yeah it's yeah, I'm scared, dude. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think you just tapped into something that I'm probably gonna need to talk with my therapist about next week. Well, because um, I don't, I don't know if it's something that can be passed. You know, when because when you talk about mm -hmm. clinical and it being a an actual piece missing in the brain, I'm like, oh man, that's that is definitely way more than how you view life. That's like it's genetic. It's a genetic it, it, thing, yeah, right? It's so genetic. it's like what you know. I'm I'm like it, I'm curious as to whether so, or not so, you can pass that. Well, scientifically, like, it, let's talk about science for, for a little bit. Yeah, there's genetic part of it. There's um, uh, the way that your brain forms, uh, mm. not only not only from experiences you've had, but also um, from 
things that were happening in you in utero. Like, I mean, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, my, my psychiatrist says it like this, the depression is a constellation of symptoms. Hmm. So the way that they figure out if you have, what kind of depression you have, how you have it is they look at that constellation of, of, um, of symptoms and they piece together the name for your specific brand of depression or uh, anxiety or personality disorders or bipolar. So bipolar disorder is a mood disorder. Major depressive disorder is a mood disorder. My brain cannot regulate my mood because my neurotransmitters are off, right? Mm. It doesn't mean that it's all physical right because it manifests itself emotionally the the best like the best way that i and you know i'm not a doctor either right. so if somebody jumps into the comments and is like this dude knows nothing about this well there's my disclaimer all right i know <laughs> i understand it from experience and from what i've tried to learn yeah uh, but please enlighten us um so so what it is unless you say it's jesus plus nothing and you don't have enough food, <laughs> in which case i would challenge i would challenge that theology i would challenge that theology yeah. but um the best illustration that i can find is that i have a friend who has he's type one diabetic and he has this little insulin pump i don't know if you guys ever have any of your friends that have he has this little insulin pump and i'll see him every once in a while you'll hear this little beep and he'll look down and he'll realize that his blood sugar uh, isn't where it needs to be. And so he'll push a little button and it will like pump insulin into his body and it will readjust uh, his blood sugar levels, right? Mm. If he doesn't do that, if he doesn't adjust those levels, then he can go into a coma. He can go into psychosis. He can wreck his car and he can and he can die. His body cannot regulate blood sugar, insulin levels, all that kind of stuff. And for me, my brain cannot regulate dopamine and serotonin and epinephrine and all of these things that come together to create a regulated mood. Mm. Wow. And, and so why do we moralize one and not the other? Mm. Right. If somebody's in a wheelchair and, and there's stairs in front of them, nobody, nobody, except for the most fundamentalist of fundamentalist people would say, you know what? Get up and walk up the stairs, dude. Just yeah. get up and walk. Just try harder. But me, my whole fucking life, people have said, dude, you just got to try. Have you made a list, Tim? Have you made a list about um, about all the things that you need uh, to do and bills you need to pay, you know, yes, I've made lists. I don't know where they are. Right. <laughs> like, like, yeah. I got a Palm pilot whenever I was a <laughs> in college, dude. a Palm pilot, because I was like, this is it. This is going to keep me organized. I lost it after a week. <laughs> no clue where it was, dude. So at Christmas time, after my first semester, I'm driving with my friend, riding with my friend in the car, and I like drop my wallet or something. So I go to pick it up underneath the seat, and guess what I find? That freaking Palm Pilot dude is there. <laughs> I took it out, I wrapped it up, and I gave it to my dad for Christmas that year, and he used it for like five. <laughs> five I was like, yes, I've made lists. Yes, I've tried to look on the sunny side of life. But my brain, I don't have a pump. I don't have a pump. So the medicines that I take, the food that I eat, the sleep that I get is all contributing to that maintenance of my brain health. Um, the, it, you know, just manifests itself emotionally. And so people get kind of freaked out about that, right? Yeah. 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 I, that was a lot. <laughs> I just no, I mean, but what you just said was kind of like... Um... I feel like anyone who is close to someone um, who lives with this in the same way, you know, you said something that kind of like hit me really, really hard, which makes me think of my brother is um, I guess just the fear or the, which I don't want to speak this into, into existence, but the fear that you said of, of not, of maybe running out of the steam of running out of the, I'm going to look at this this way or I'm going to whatever like that. I feel like that's a very real fear for a lot of people that, that deal 
um, that live with this mental disorder, you know, like running out of that steam of that positivity or that, yeah. that effort to try the next thing, the next combination of things, the, the next Palm yeah. pilot, you know, it's, yeah. and so, it, you know, the fact that you speak with the eloquence that you do and the, the charisma that you do, you know, it really, it's really like uh, encouraging and a testament, like for real, for real. It tethers, me, it tethers me to life. Like that's what I think a lot of people don't understand is that I'm not like, I don't want someone to ask me all the time whenever I'm out in the community, like, hey, how you doing, bud? Right. You know, how you doing? Because they saw my Facebook post or my Instagram mm -hmm. story about me being in the hospital, but they do that. And I'm willing to like put, I'm willing to engage that because I know that the stigma on the other side costs lives. Mm -hmm. When the stigmas stay in place, people die. Right. Like it's just the case. Like people, people die. If we don't talk about it, if I don't share like what I've been through and what I'm going through, like as a family, like, like, it's not because I'm a savior. It's not because I feel like I can just like save everybody. But like, I know that like, if I don't talk about it, someone will get caught up in that. And you know who that someone is most of the time? It's me. Hmm. I have to talk about it because it tethers me to this world and to these people and to this community um, on the days whenever it's really, really hard to i just don't i don't think that it's just there are some days that are just really really hard really really difficult and so I, if i if if i dig into isolationism and hiding um the likelihood we know this from the data, the likelihood of me completing suicide is higher. So I try to live in the open mm -hmm. uh, as a safeguard. Sure. For me, and, and you know, people don't always understand that, um, but it, it, it helps me. It's not selfish necessarily, I don't think, but um, where stigmas exist, like death is there. Right. Right along with it. Because it causes isolation and it causes you to like retreat into yourself. And then if you retreat into yourself so far, uh, you know, you're never going to see that light, even though like, you know, we're created from light and created for light, right? Like it's in there. My favorite passage of scripture that I hold on to, even after everything else that I've called out and sifted through is that Psalm 139 that, that, you know, if I make my bed in the pit, of hell, even there, your right hand will guide me for the darkness is as light to you, right? And so John in his epistle is writing and he says that, don't you know that like perfect love dispels all fear? And, so, and I'm not capable of perfect love. So if perfect love dispels all fear, if perfect love dispels all darkness, then my imperfect love will at least dispel a little bit, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, so, um, I just really try to cling to that light, even if it's like barely flickering there, because it can still, um, you know, we do no great things, only small things with great love. Like mother Teresa says that, you know, and, uh, and wow. I'm a firm believer in that. I just got into my feelings real big. Oh, I love it, man. I well, love um, it. Cause that's like, you know, it's even, uh, even there's even a passage in Psalm 18 and it talks about that he wraps himself in darkness that covered him like a tent. And Dude. it's, it's the thought of the God of light, right? The light, the ultimate light wraps himself in darkness that even in the, even in the darkness, there's light. Like and they look at it in a scientific level, uh, down to the smallest thing. There's actually fractions of light within darkness, right? Like, Fascinating. It's, it's so interesting. So it's fascinating. Dude, I, it, it takes so much courage, man, to do what you're doing. And just even, I think there's so many things that, you know, someone listening to this could take away today from listening to you. So dude, I just want to commend you for just being courageous on your journey. I know it's, you're still on it. You're still in your process. And, uh, it's so encouraging 
to just see you be so open and honest as a tool that's ultimately for yourself and your own progress, but it's something, it's a tool that other people can like grab onto and can help them in their journey as well. Yeah. So. I mean, like we, 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 we link arms and leave creation in our wake, right? Like that, that's the vision. It's not linking arms and floating down the lazy river. It's like yeah. linking arms and leaving creation in our wake. And, and, uh, and, uh, I'm just, I have all of these. And here's the thing too, man. I, I need to just have a conversation with y'all like off, off camera about how y'all do the work that you do. Um, because uh, it, it, this is the thing that I'm called to right now. The vocation, Frederick Buechner said that like your vocation, your calling is where the world's deep hunger and your deep gladness meet, right? And it, and so he, he also said that religion uh, um, is, and and sex are like dynamite. It can be used to heal the human heart or not. not what is this? Yeah. Not dynamite. Um, uh, damn dude. I messed up his quote. Uh, it's like nitri nitrous, like you, or something like you put in, it can be used to heal the human heart or blow up a bridge. Right. And so, uh, I, he's just an incredible person. That's just a freebie read Frederick Buechner. But like for me, to, to be liberated myself and to liberate others, to like live into the truth of who they are, even if they live with a mental health disorder, um, that's the that's the that's the calling. Classroom to the conference room, church pew mm -hmm. to the bar stool, wherever it is, whoever you are, if this is a part of your story, like let's let's put on our grippy socks together and let's just leave creation in our wake, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like that's the that's the vision. Um, I freaking love it, dude. I absolutely do. I'm not I'm not gonna lie. Like you're you're the type of cat, you know, if you lived in our city, we would kick it with you, bro. Bro, I Dead would, ass. how about I just come to Nashville or, or LA and, uh, bro, can, if you're ever, uh, holla. We, we have been yeah. real and thinking about you in Nashville the last couple of days, dude, it's heartbreaking. It uh, is, man. It's, 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 you know, I was going to talk to B about this, but I want to do, I want to do episodes where we do tackle, um, uh, current issues and even though they're hot hot button yeah. like a couple you know this this gun thing like i we don't really get into politics well, um, I'm but i i don't i don't really speak about it from a political perspective i'm an educator and i'm in yeah yeah all day every day and um real quick though i want to read this to you i'm sorry oh. keep your thought thank you uh karen says thank you timothy for sharing and discussing your past and present one of my sisters has been depressed for years and it flows up and down this gave me a lot of hope Wow, Karen, that's incredible. Thanks for sharing that. I really appreciate that. But go ahead. As an educator, you said, yeah, it, it's it's just uh, it's 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 a it's a tragedy that that we live with on the daily basis. You know, we we can't keep our doors open in our school, even though it's liberating for ourselves and our students to have that free flow. We have to have them locked, and even that becomes a small t trauma where yeah. we lose community and connection, right? And so um, for me, it's just so much bigger than than any kind of soundbite. Um, but if I were to, it, the distillation of it is that, you know, six people are dead. Yeah. And it, it's nine, nine minutes from my house. You yeah, know, man. it's very... Nine minutes from you, dude? Yeah, mm -hmm. bro. It's super close. Wow. And, you know, some of the things that popped up that I was like, oh, these are going to be sound bites, you know? Like, I, I knew the second you found out what type of guns it was. I know initially when I found out it was a girl. But then I was like, that doesn't make sense because girls don't usually act out in this way. Even though I, I, I learned yesterday, my friend told me that the first mass shooter in America was a girl, which I yeah. gotta look that up. So, but it's not typical for women to, to act out in this way. And then then you find out I was a trans woman. And so now I'm like, oh, that's gonna be the headline for the right. That would be another thing that, that they try to um, push. And not that I'm, I'm more centered than anything, but I think the thing that it, the thing that hit me the most about it was we're so smart. We are so smart, you know, like we're figuring out ways to, to take normal people to the moon, but we can't figure this shit out. And well, I keep contending yeah, I that it's like, yeah. it has to happen to the right person. Like this negative thing has to happen to the right, uh, powerful person in order to enact some kind of change. Cause as long as it keeps happening to normal people, 
powerful people are just going to say what they they always say well isn't that what jesus does like he he challenges power or what paul called principalities you know and powers uh in and and to me for me isaiah 2 that you know that they will take their swords and beat them into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and nation will not rise up against nation anymore for me for me to walk in the way of jesus for me means a a a a dedication to submitting like the tools of violence to the refining fire of god's love and allowing god to shape those into um instruments of cultivation and growth and so for me i'm like okay if I want to walk in the way of Jesus, and there's a lot of reasons why I've wanted to leave the church. Mm-hmm. A ton. A butt ton. All right. right. Just like how, as my kids say, a, a, a butt ton of reasons for me to like want to leave the church. But but in that, I just find that it is if I'm willing to dismantle and deconstruct whatever it is in me that's holding me away from this radical, inclusive uh, gospel of Jesus, then, um, then, then there's a reason to stay, right? There's a reason to stay and there's a reason to fight Mm (laughs) nonviolently, like for people to, um, to see this liberating gospel. Um, and when it comes to gun violence, I think we know the answer. We just don't, like you said, man, what does it mean for me as a teacher in the classroom to challenge the powerful in an effort to save lives i think i think it it becomes more of a it's like what we do with christianity right we have this insane problem with the lgbtq community and we and we do it with the with a violent righteousness because that's what we call it we call it righteousness we're protecting jesus and his religion yeah protecting our families we're protecting our family We're, we're protecting jesus and I think, man, you're you're going so hard as if these people are taking your places in heaven. Like as if that if if one of them gets in, one of you don't. So you got to defend this shit to the death. And yeah. I feel like we create extremes way more to uh, to hide the things that we really want. An extremist is like, yo, I understand. I'm, I'm a second amendment dude, like for, for real, for real. But from my understanding, was this was, this was in, this was implemented so that uh, government couldn't just run shot on you. Like if, if you had to defend yourself, um, the right to bear arms would be it if your, if your government overreached. Yeah. So we have. Yeah. I think like. And me and my boy had this conversation. He's like, yo, let them come try to, you know, like they were doing in Australia, like we're like, yeah, yeah, coming and getting you if you didn't, if you weren't vaxxed or if you weren't this, like he's like, let somebody come. And I'm like, I get your point. I get your point. But if our government, the most powerful and deadliest government on the face of the planet and in human history, no, no military has ever been this strong. If they want to come take us out, they going to take us out. And your little AR-15s and your little <laughs> fucking Call of Duty training, that shit ain't going to do nothing. If they seen Navy, Navy SEAL Team 6, they will wipe your ass out before you even know that you got to yeah. go get your gun. So it's like that argument I, is like, yeah, I mean, I, I want you to defend yourself, like for real. And I, I'm not even against yeah. an AR-15. I'm just saying like. The reasons that we use of why we're going to fight for this thing is like the extremes. And I guess that's what these things are for. But I'm like, there has to be a middle ground. So I don't want to take your AR-15. I don't want to take your shit. I don't want to keep it if if that is your fear. Because I I also don't want to look at you and be like, oh, you shouldn't be fearful of that. Because that's just then me projecting onto you. But I just think we're like, we are so smart. There has to be a way to just figure this out together to where both sides are like, I can rock with that. I'm good with that. Yeah. Uh, Dude, I I was going to say this. Uh, I remember a while back, uh, Brian Zahn, who I've talked about several times on here, 
he uh, he had tweeted this thing, and I thought it was so clever, and it was so sad at the same time. And he said, "In gun we trust, mm. gun gun bless America, wow, w- one nation under gun." <laughs> this is the idolatry and, of our day. It really and, is, and you know, and it and it's funny because under that, the, obviously, the comments were getting lit up, and it, it just makes you think. It's like the religious devotion that people have to guns among uh, American evangelicals, at least for it's sure. just, it's just flat out bizarre. It doesn't like, make it's sense just, to, to me. It's with very strange. It's very strange to me. Like, it's like the devotion that you show here, like I will flip it and turn it to a preacher for in a second is like, if you show this devotion to living out the sermon on the Mount, you would have revival in your community. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's, like, that's really if, powerful, man. If you, if you went this hard, and loving your neighbor oh my gosh like you would see transformation and again it's it's the question sometimes it it becomes this shallow thing of like protection and all these these like very much so logical answers but the question is so much deeper than that that christ invites us into and it's into his way right and that is the nonviolent. that is the peaceable kingdom of god and what is that it? actually what- yeah, or what Dr. King called the beloved community, right? Yeah. Like, like he says, if you're going to call me extremist, that's fine. Call me an extremist for love. And Brandon, I, I, I think, I think that, it, and maybe in, in Manny, like I, I think that where for me, where mental health and policy and religion, spirituality, Jesus kind of collide, is that I'm somebody who is has an increased risk of dying by suicide. I want gun laws enacted that could prevent me from going to Walmart right now and having a firearm in my house. Right. I'm not talking about like anything other than me as a human being saying to the government and the regulators or whatever, I'm at a higher risk for dying by suicide. I want to put my name on a list so that Anytime I try to go and buy a gun, I can't get it. Now, mm. can I get a gun if I want it? Yeah, I can go to a million different places and find a gun. But is it going to be harder for me? Is it going to give me 10 extra seconds or 10 extra minutes to really contemplate if this is the path that I want to go down to? Is it one more gate between me and ending my life by suicide? Like, like yeah, it, it, it is. And so for, for me, like gun control is a very – real thing Mm -hmm. um because of a susceptibility that i have a a weakness that i have or a reality in which i live um guns are the leading cause of of death for children in our country Mm -hmm. and 95 percent of uh suicide attempts something like that 95 percent of suicide attempts it it might be less than that y'all can check that all right but high high 80 to 90 something percent of suicides um that are completed are done with firearms Hmm. taking pills hanging yourself all that stuff has a very low um likelihood of being successful that's why so many people that die by suicide use a firearm because it's pretty much like a hundred percent that that that's gonna that that's gonna happen so i want gun legislation not just for those kids at covenant school not just for the kids at santa fe not just for the kids um you know in odessa and Mid- like i have a friend who was shot in odessa during a mass shooting their little two-year-old wow bullet went right through mouth she survived and i'm so grateful but i want it for them but i also want it for me like we need to live in a place where it's safe for me um to you know, if we want if we want people to stop dying by suicide, which I want, <laughs> I don't know anyone that'd be like, nah, yeah. just let them. You know, you know, then then we can make policies that allow people to have their freedoms, but also provide protection for the most vulnerable. Um, um, I kind of look like a lumberjack right now, like. <laughs> go out hunting right now just like take this hat off and put on one of those like uh hunting caps. <laughs> yeah. i yeah. i i always you know i i 
I hearken back to the Garden of Gethsemane and the and the one time that a violent act was happening. It's Jesus was the first one to be like, "Bro, you gotta put your sword away." Away, yeah. And, it, by, and it, 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 I I yeah. don't know a lot of people. This this is the one thing, especially in America, that we'd overlook Jesus's way of handling of violence. We we just it's just. We'll, yeah, we'll find every single justification to be like, nah, bruh. Like, we're going to have to go with the stars and stripes on this one. <laughs> we're going to have to go with this damn, you know, this concoction that our forefathers did over Jesus's, like, let me heal this guy's ear and say, exactly. bruh, let it be. Like, we're well, good. And, and, and honestly, like, I, I've been challenged by that, by that text in my own journey because, like, I'm really kind to other people and i really want jesus to heal their ears but dude i'll take that sword and start hacking away at my self-confidence hacking away at like my own sense of like belovedness and i feel like jesus has said to me in my mental health struggle and in the way that i've walked and lived with mental health like dude put down the sword mm. put it down you live by the sword you're gonna die by the sword yeah with every self-inflicted wound that i create and i'm good at it I'm good at it. Uh, and Jesus is like, you know, so maybe that's where the transformation, the societal transformation happens whenever we ourselves as followers of Jesus, like say, okay, I'm going to treat myself with that grace and that dignity that you talk about that gift, right? Mm -hmm. Whenever I treat myself as the beloved child of God that I am, right? And from that transformation happens because I'm able to interact with other people. But that doesn't mean that I get to stop taking my medicine. Right, right. That, that doesn't mean that I get to stop going to therapy. What it does mean is that I can acknowledge even in the deepest, darkest moments, and I can have someone reflect back to me that, you know what? Like when God created me, God said, that's good. Mm -hmm. that's, even, even though I'm not 100% you know, firing on all cylinders. Yeah. <laughs> Even though I might be a little throat off as my friends <laughs> sometimes say, like, uh, you know, um, to me, that's the transformation of my heart leads to the transformation uh, of the world. Yeah. You know? yeah. And I love you guys. I like, I genuinely like want to hang out. I want to fly to LA and then I want to fly to Nashville. For real. No. And, I... or dude, you could do a twofer. I mean, when Manny's back in LA. Man, yeah, I'll we'll get back to here. We I'm live with the... Yeah, we live like a little less than 14 minutes away from each other. Yeah, I live so we're we're in a I'm in LA and Nashville. So we're back and forth. So I'll leave this Friday back to LA, be there for like two and a half weeks and then come back to Nashville and then back to LA. Do you like that? Do you is it Yeah, tiring? I love it. I love it because I get I get to live in two worlds. Like I'm in a very red state and then I live in a very blue state. And so it's very much uh, one of those things where I'm like, oh, I get to see policies in real life. But yeah. our community is L.A. because that's, okay. you know, Brandon and, and our whole community is there. I have I have homies here, but uh, we have community. I know. There. Speak, speaking of community, Angie's on her way over here. We're having dinner tonight. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. yeah. That's I'll my wife. Angie's my wife. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> what are y'all going to eat? Uh, my wife, Maddie, she's making she some sort of banging. Pasta. I, I see some vodka out, so probably some vodka, something, something pasta. It's bomb though. That sounds really good, man. I uh, I need. I, I haven't eaten tonight. It's uh, my son, my little son, Quinn is playing baseball, so I'm about to get a uh, an update from from them, and then I might, dude, I might just do like the whole pint of ice cream thing. Yeah. <laughs> There's nobody else here, and so like, I don't have to share it with anyone. And then I'll throw it away and take the trash out to the dumpster, and like no one will know. No one will know. No, no. I just set it on no on, on the internet. No questions asked. Yeah. Where did the ice cream go? <laughs> well, me. But I'm gonna fly out to LA next week and hang out with my new friends Manny and Brandon. Bro, no cap for real. Like if you ever do end up flying to LA, like holler at us because we'll don't just yeah. see it, dude. I will show up. I will. Um, we'll kick it, bro. <laughs> we'll what's... kick it. There's Uncle, there's no uh, falsities. 
what's the name of the dude that just shows up in Christmas Vacation? Uncle Eddie. Uncle Eddie. I will. Uncle yeah. Eddie. <laughs> All right. I will knock on your door, and you'll be, and I'll be like, "Where's the vodka and pasta?" <laughs> and uh, and just show myself in, dude. Christian community, man. I love it, yeah, bro. Dude, spicy vodka pasta, man. We'll got it. We'll save a bowl for you, bro. All right. That sounds really good, good, man. Bro, thanks so much for for being here. Uh, everybody who joined live, we're going again live tomorrow at seven thirty Central standard time so if you guys want to be a part of the conversation again come join us we appreciate it timothy we appreciate it and like we always love to say we pray you find a seat at the table but if you don't you are always welcome at ours cheers <laughs>